the only talk that I want to do is to introduce you, Morrison Chang, who will introduce yourself and tell us all about you, and then talk to us about Android security. Okay. Go to it. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, let me let me go uh, start the screen share because honestly, I uh, am new to this particular piece of software, so I do apologize. Uh, just tell me if everyone can see the Android security primer screen, or at least I can something see it. resembles that. I can see and, it. Uh, Ari, something? What? Okay. Yep. Good enough. That's all. I, I, I have difficulty seeing uh, what's going on. So, anyway. Yeah, I can all right. see it too. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, welcome to Android Security Primer. Uh, my name is Morrison Chang. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, with regard to development on Android, I've been doing stuff with Android since the uh, uh, the Android developer phone G1 days back in 2009, 10, thereabouts. Um, I presented at AndevCon and DroidCon, uh, and in my past life, I've done embedded, I've done finance, and I've done advertising tech. So I've done a lot of different things, so some of which uh, may apply, some of which doesn't, but this is the mobile thing. Uh, please uh, interject, and uh, we'll, let's see how this goes. So to be clear, I just wanted to bring up with what is security? Uh, security from the Wikipedia definition is freedom from or resilience against potential harm or other unwanted coercive change from external forces. So all that means is, you know, you're safe from, you pretty much are safe from harm. Of course, there's still the definition of what's harm. Uh, so the other thing to do is, and if you're thinking about what is harm, then you kind of have to define what, what the threats are. Uh, from from regard to security, then then from an application perspective, exactly like who who are you protecting against, and what are you protecting against from? Um, so, a good way of thinking about it is thinking it from a threat analysis perspective. Uh, it's just basically thinking of who are my users and what are the threats that that when I say users, it's both the the uh, you know people who actually have access to your app on the phone. So, what are the threats? So uh, for normal or casual user, they follow the rules. They are not going to do anything bad. They're not going to do anything harmful to your app or your, uh, the system that you're supporting with that app. Um, uh, you know, pretty much it's like, you know, you're playing your game, you're reading your, you're reading your, uh, your Twitter feed, whatever. Uh, with regards, there's also active users. What I define as active users. Active users want to try to do things, you know, within their environment to see if they can get some extra extra stuff. Uh, let's, uh, the easiest example I said was uh, the New York Times app, for example, for a while had a, a magic file uh, that was basically said, hey, uh, you've seen five articles, 10 articles this month, you can't see anymore. Well, if you could find the file, you could wipe the file, uh, you could actually reload the app and then all of it, and reload, what I mean reload, basically restart the app and it would now know, hey, you know, you still have five free articles available to read. That sort of thing. I would call those, that, that kind of consi you know, consideration slightly from an active user. You're not doing anything truly sneaky or truly difficult. I mean, you know, uh, from a perspective, you could either do it within the app, uh, in which case it, they'd have to wipe the data every single time and re-download. Or you could be doing it like in shared storage and it's a magic file that tries to survive, uh, you know, got people who delete the app or restart it or something like that and say like, you know, see if, uh, you know, they, they will sign up for your subscription for your service. Then we get into something that's a little bit more challenging, like the casual pirate. Uh, casual pirates, I call those, they have some technical skills. Script kitties is a nice way of putting it. Um, they, they are pretty much using stuff that other people have built, um, to either crack your app or do stuff. Now, admittedly, this is more on the games perspective, but this could also be for, you know, some type of, uh, online bidding process or online sales process. You know, it's like, can they somehow, uh, inject something er erroneous and possibly get further into your system? So one way is to basically, ha uh, at least be secure or at least be understanding that that's one possible vector of attack. Then we get to the active pirate. Well, I call for, those are truly for game piracy, 
uh, people who try to build game bots, those were people with actual technical skills. Those people are actually uh, reverse engineering your app, maybe trying to figure out where the license server is, and then pretty much like you know short circuiting it, sort short circuiting it so that they can you know distribute you know what you what you would be downloading for like you know uh, the the five dollar music app or the uh, you know or or uh, whatever uh, you know feature laden app podcast app whatever you want uh, that you know they want to be able to get those out for free partially they do it for the challenge other and partially because uh, in certain parts of the world five dollars is a lot of money so they don't want to spend it on that even though they, they do want the features uh, even further as a threat is government and it was what I called the both the go as government and three-letter acronym uh, type agencies, uh, you know, NSA, CIA, KGB, whatever you want to call that. So those would be developing, doing things like, you know, either deploying automated rootkits, uh, zero days, and stingrays. Now, just in case to give everybody a level set, uh, a stingray is a uh, is a wife is a cellular tower that is not owned by the cellular company. So fundamental. So what it is is that your phone is actually connecting to a, a bogus a bogus network they then can inject whatever they want into it and then hopefully employ a zero day. A zero day is pretty much a, uh, a vulnerability that, ha that has been known into the wild and is uh, critical to, that is considered critical enough that's, that it could actually compromise the security of your device. Um, and with automated root kits is pretty much, you know, using a zero day would be like, hey, I can root it, I can now put in, put in my own code and therefore, I can, uh, you know, now see the person's contact list. I can now do you know, do other, you know, do monitor, surreptitiously monitor calls. Uh, all of those uh, very, very complex. All of those much, much more advanced things. It also could also be as simple as, you know, inject inject something simple so that you can actually that that could be used in social engineering or along those lines. But fundamentally, that's that's you know, I'm going to keep to that. So can I ask a question about this slide? What I don't see sure. here, or I don't think I see, is uh, the very malicious black hat hacker. Um, I, I, I kind worse, of than, worse than an active pirate, but certainly not government or three letter acronym type. Mm, true. Uh, I, I think you might be right that I might be missing that one. Um, I'm just not too sure the, the, the difference in skill level between an active pirate and a black hat is, is much thinner, I think. Okay. But but we could argue that maybe I mean it's really a, it's a matter of like are they trying to uh, a pirate or a black hat is fundamentally they are trying to break into your thing and get value out of it and not pay for it. Okay. All of them are trying to like casual pirate and active pirate are just measures on that scale They're like if, you know, like how deep into the weeds are they trying to get in to do things. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. We could argue we you know we can argue that some. All right, so the other aspect is data security and application security. So there is the data security of the data between your device and your server. There's the security of the data that's on the device. And then there is what can be protected with the, within the application itself. So between app and server, uh, I hope everyone is familiar with uh, proxies for HTTP and HTTPS. I, I hope, I'm not sure, I can't tell because I can't see everybody and I'm not from, completely familiar with what people, people's experiences are. But to be, to be clear, uh, a man in the middle proxy is, is great for debugging. You have uh, a JSON payload that you're parsing from a server. You're trying to figure out, hey, why isn't this actually, you know, one week it's working fine, next week it's not working. The answer is, of course, you have to actually look at the data that's coming to you and what you're sending it and seeing if it matches expectations on both sides. One way to do that is through a proxy, uh, a proxy server. So you connect that through your device to, the, to your laptop or PC, which would then connect off to the internet or your server. And then you could watch all the HTTP traffic going, between the, going through. So you can see, oh, you know, they changed the formatting here and therefore my parsing is breaking or it's not breaking because it can handle that, but it's giving me, it's putting a, cu a couple of null values because it didn't know how to handle, you know, uh, that particular case, that sort of thing. Um, because you didn't want it to fail, but you want it to fail gracefully. But the question is, did you monitor it correctly? Or, uh, you know, did you uh, set up, you know, basically, the idea is just basically, I need a second, I need 
not my app because I, try, I you know, I've written, you know, I've been looking at it for so long. I'm, I think I know everything in there is working correctly, and not necessarily what the server side is telling you, but to see exactly what's going on in between, uh, to see what's going on. You could just use curl statements or something, but if you're in a live environment with a live app, man, in the, uh, using a proxy uh, such as Charles or Wireshark or something like that is one way of checking to see what's going on, going between your the app and the server side. So, so these are software that helps you see what's going on between the right. requester and the and the responder. And Correct. And in the middle, in this case, doesn't refer to anything malicious. It's it's just it's the proxy that you put there. Yeah. For for yeah, the proxy is it, you know now the proxy is just a tool. You if you don't you, it, you know, as a debugging tool, it's great. It has value. It also can be used in a malicious way. If I'm if I'm someone trying to understand how to inject things in, I want to know how you're sending things back up to the server side, you know, or things coming down, maybe, you know, tokens for value or whatever. So that, that's another way of doing it. So again, it's a, it's a tool, but it's, to, it's, it's used by both developers. It's also used by both the pirates and the black hats and things like that. Okay, another thing to add in is to, to do certificate pinning. Certificate pinning for SSL is uh, not is basically you're using SSL, uh, but you're also using your certificate that's not necessarily publicly available uh, to hit an endpoint uh, to make sure that those those two are matched. Now, admittedly, um, that has to be delivered in your app, and there's a little bit of uh, issue going. And I did do some reading that there's some issues going on with regard to how truly secure is it. It, it just it, in 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 one sense, all it would do is just make any any man in the middle harder, uh, but it also would make it harder for you to debug in a live environment. But, but not so much because you would have a certificate. It would be harder for the for the attacker to get to. I mean, they would have to extract out the certificate, and then I would have to do it. it. It's possible, but it basically means more work for them to do anything. Um, Okay, and finally, you could also encrypt the messages, like through RSA or something like that, for more security with regard to th with regard to how things are moving across the wire. So it would just be a binary blob. Uh, again, more complications for debugging. You'd have to write a additional code to actually uh, extract out maybe messages that you see in the middle, so you can see, ah, okay, this is this is this message is going to that endpoint, and how how what does it look like? It's a matter of ba to make things harder for your app to be attacked also makes things harder for you to debug and develop. So that's, that's the problem with that. So back to on device, if you're on Unruly device, uh, apps should be able to see different app data. Um, that's pretty much by default. Everybody, you know, like your app, if you just download an app off the app store, app one is not gonna see what's in the app data and app, app data and app two or app three. Uh, provide you know uh, as long as it's unrooted and uh, you don't have an official sort of con like uh, uh, content provider sharing data or anything like that. In which case, those are official mechanisms. That's fine. <coughs> you can then you can on you can also store keys in your APK. Uh, you also have to then assume that you can trust the device and or the keys are not necessarily truly valuable. They are just access mechanisms. You could also you know do in-app obfuscation. And in other words, you can break up your keys within the code so that them to, re to resolve getting the keys becomes harder um, or the encryption gets harder or something like that. Um, so when you say store keys in APK... Um, that's no different than, let's say, your, your Maps API key or something like that. Okay. So, so those are that kind, that, that sort of key where it's already sort of signed to your... Uh, your your uh, signing key and your app, but that's also the rest of the si rest of Google systems that support it, or it could be another system that's basically saying, hey, you know, I just I, I have another app that's running to verify your identity. This app is correctly uh, calling the endpoint. Okay, so where else would I store a key if not somewhere in the APK? Uh, honestly, that's where pretty much it basically then that has to go from the server. It literally would then have to come from the server, and that's where you do short-term keys via OAuth or something like that. Okay. So you would have to be signing in, delivering it from you know from your app into the server. Server then delivers either a short-term key or something like that, and then so you could be doing this for login, 
or you could be doing this for uh, you know, well actually it's pretty much what's for login or some type of identity management like this this user or this 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 token is now authorized to to do to do the activities against the server that's supposed to and and oh and uh, additionally there is a there's a user secret um, if it's available you can lock it in the key store uh, key store is an interesting place of that's available in Android it it uh, it actually there is some training in that and the funny thing is the implement detail, detail details have changed between Android 5 6 7 and 8 Less so, those are in implementation details, less so uh, the actual, uh, at the Java level, what you would be doing. However, it did does change some, I think, some of the available encryption mechanisms. Um, if you have, for example, a fingerprint reader, uh, you could have, uh, you can have a, a trusted, uh, a, a, a trusted execution environment. Um, those would be best for uh, holding on to things. Now, the idea is that it would basically live on your phone or on your device. So you would then maybe uh, get an OAuth key and then you'd hide and you put it into the t you know, t you know, into the into the into the key store, and that way. Oops, I'm getting feedback. That was that was uh, my daughter calling. Uh, I'll okay. call her back later. Oops. Okay. Uh, that would be. Uh, the 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 key store allows you to put things on device in a much more secure enclave. Um, it does necessitate the fact that it does, but doing that means that it is now bound just to that device. So the question becomes, how do you? Ask? The question for people would then be, how do I would attack it before it either gets in or out of the key? Um, so, uh, one other thing is development security. So, I assume everyone has written an app, know about the debug key, um, know about the release key. Uh, please be aware that, you know, back up your release key store um, along with its password. Uh, there are many, many, many posts on Stack Overflow people trying to find a way how to, like, recover it, and the answer is it's not really recoverable. Um, so, there may... So Give me one sec. Um, there may be a lot of people who are um, watching this presentation who haven't had to deal with those keys because they haven't actually had to deploy to the Play Store, but have only deployed to um, emulators. Ah, okay. Or to so phones that are to phones that are developer. Um, right. Um, so let, let me. Let me okay. Okay, so let me just walk through that up, back out a bit. So if I, I'm going to make the assumption that you at least built a Hello World app and you deployed it to your phone, at some point during when you did that, it said like, hey, create a debug key store, and you created some, some just basically clicked OK. Um, if I remember, it's either a null password or a generic password that's being used for the, for the debug key store. Those were only good for one year. Um, so if you're, say you've been developing for pretty much a year since the first time you launched an, like, uh, uh, the Android Studio, you may find that your app or your debug key store has expired and then now you have to basically recreate it again and delete the apps that are on your phone and then install the ones that you're interested in testing against. Um, I see someone who says, Google manages my keys, good or bad? Question mark. Ah. Right. So, okay. So, let me. I'll catch. Let me catch up to that part really quickly. So, as a part of development and deploying onto the Play Store, you're supposed to create a 25-year key. Um, you're supposed to then sign your app, and then that means that P any any APK that's signed with that release key store is you is the one that's is, they know it's coming from you, the original author, and that's the honest uh, truth. For the longest time, pretty much as I said, back up the key store and save it with its password. Since September 2017, Google Play has created an app signing key management system. Uh, basically, they're the ones now signing the app key and they're providing you what they call the upload key. Uh, so you would then sign it with the upload key and then you would then, and then that would then deploy it out to uh, um, the Google Play store. 
my I expect the the reasoning for this was that there were way too many cases of when you have different development teams, either either the, you don't you don't you don't have a necessarily. The problem is if you're not uh, uh, good about like how how do I sign an I sign an APK that I've got just gotten from my offshore development team and I don't necessarily like know what they've done or I don't know what they know, that means you're pretty much trusting them with the signing key. And if you trust them with the signing key, you pretty much trust them with uh, your life, with the exception, like if it, they basically can hold, kind of hold you, well, they can't hold you hostage, but they have one half of the puzzle, which the other half is to get into so my expectation was is that they realized that they need something a little bit more flexible with regard to um, dealing with third party development teams and this is one way of doing it. Um, I have not actually tried this out. I do apologize. Um, I honestly do think this is a nice idea simply because uh, this does allow you to, uh, uh, you know, um, at least Concentrate. Actually, concentrates the problem in one place. It means that your 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 administration rights to the uh, to the Play Store become much more important, but it's no no more or less important than it was before. Uh, but now that it could actually like give you assigning keys and things like that. So and there's a okay, the other Mark, thing I'm to gonna, I'm going to interrupt with a question here on the chat line from a basic Android student, um, and you don't have to interrupt your flow to answer it, but just keep in mind that we'll cover it at some point, which I, it may be a theme your presentation, maybe not. Um, the question is... Oh, I, is that the one about the Java and the XMLs and everything? Let me see. Or, or I'm the different one. part where I'm learning life cycle of activity yeah. and bundles. At this point, I can see the source code, Java files and XML files. Does security start at this level? Is the question. Oh, uh, coding and commenting habits. It, it, it's really good habits to start with at this point, and and you don't have to address that question immediately. Yeah, let, let, let me. I think we can we can pick that up in the discussion afterwards. There's not much many more slides left, um, and okay. I'll, I'll address it then. Sure. Uh, okay. okay. So stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned. Um, so app signing. Uh, I understand why they did it. I think it's a good idea. It does put a little bit more. Uh, it does mean that that uh, your your login credentials, your administration credentials for your publisher also become a little bit more important because from there you pretty much then assign or download a new key. Uh, but you could also you know revoke those. But if you lose that, you pretty much lost your publisher capability. Um, but then again, that's no different than what it was before. Piracy. I'm gonna just touch on piracy. Uh, so piracy. Did I actually throw all of the? Nope. I had missed a few. Okay. Yeah, I did put it there. So piracy is uh, the act of. Uh, everyone knows what piracy is. You want to pirate a game? Great. How do you do? That? How do you manage that? There's like you can extract out the APK, do some reverse engineering. Uh, there are apps that now uh, you, that Google present Google for for has does have a licensing server capability which allows some protection. Um, I would basically call it some protection. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and how much effort you're going to put into it. Um, so we'll go move on. So the Google Play licensing ties the app to the Google Play Store and services. So if, well, when Amazon was still having their, their store, I think their store still exists, but I'm not sure they're maintaining it. Well, they may have their own uh, lighting service. So it's much uh, a way to uh, tie your APK to the licensing, uh, to the licensing, and therefore they know that it's coming from the correct, the data is coming from the correct place, or the, or the, the app itself, is being run is not been is not being run from um, a lot of source for for example. However, and this is the thing: piracy exists. Uh, piracy scripts exist to to uh, automate removal of the sample code from Google Play licensing. So, if you're just using some of the Google Play license sample code, don't do that. <laughs> um, they
Morrison, I can't hear you. Uh, I lost connection there for a bit. Okay. Let's, let's try. Uh, can you see my screen again or not? I can, yep, yep. I can't see your okay. screen. I can see you. Uh, okay, so let me just try the screen share again. We just go. Screen, yes, no? Yep, yep. Okay, yeah. So let me, uh, I think I got cut off right around the point of talking, starting to talk about Google Play licensing. Um, so there are, like, it ties you to the Google Play Store and services, piracy, scripts to automate removal of the sample code, do change the sample code, something more complicated. Uh, if you, you can Google that you can actually do a little, you can search in that material and then find out like more details on like why people want to do that, like the, uh, the uh, ways to do that. Uh, reverse engineering. So all these things predicate the fact that I'm, guess what? You can actually take an APK and turn it back into some form that you can inspect and modify. So I'm giving you the link to the APK tool. Um, this is out on GitHub. Well, if you, as long as you can look up uh, Android reverse engineering APK tool, you'll find it. So uh, it's actually kind of an interesting exercise to do on your own code just to see what it looks like. It is not, it doesn't look like Java. It looks a little bit different, uh, but it is still readable and it is editable. So if you want to repackage it again and resign it, it is completely possible. Uh, but it is uh, definitely not, um, remember, it, by the time it gets into an APK, it's already DEX files. Uh, to be clear, DEX files is the class file types being used by, by Android, which is not a class file like you see in Java. Um, it's, it's their own little byte code format. So it won't look it won't look similar-ish, but it'll look it will it'll be different, but it'll be it's still code. So if you spend some time, you can look at it, you can then inspect it, you can make modifications, and you can figure out ways of putting it back together again. So what to do? So at this point, you should always think that the client is suspect at all times, um, because if they're on a root device, they can take out your they can basically do whatever they like to your client and depending upon the level of effort um, it either they will either try it or not and it was like if I all I have is a simple to do app that's free and maybe has ads maybe they don't care if I have a hot selling game they're probably trying to create bots and definitely you know you almost should not be trusting the client almost uh, in that case you should be if you have a server component and typically uh, for those things of higher value it, it, sh it should and does Verify the action behavior on the server. Um, in other words, uh, typically in a game, uh, you know, uh, uh, player behavior, you can't magically move like a, a thousand, a, you know, a thousand miles in a, in a different direction if you're just on foot. Things like that. Um, and of course, it's always a constant battle as a target. There, there are tons of resources online about how games handle bots and attacks. Curiously, if you're doing financial applications or you're doing something related to like uh, purchasing activities, those are the sim similar techniques used by those uh, game, very like uh, the, the popular AAA games and that sort of thing, is actually probably what you should at least be thinking of as a possibility. Um, mainly because they already will have to have done most of the hard work with regard to what works, what doesn't work, uh, how to mitigate it, everything from, you know, dealing with uh, IP behavior and things of that nature. Uh, there's a lot more intricacies involved, um, but be, able, be aware that, that if, you're, if the more uh, critical or valuable your data becomes, then don't be afraid to look at other industries to give you a better idea of like, what do I do in this case? Um, privacy. Uh, privacy is kind of this weird area in security. It's part of the total application for both the client, the mobile web, and the server. And of course, I'm just going to touch on GDPR because I kind of threw it in here. So GDPR. Say again? Is someone asking a question? All right, I'm going to continue. This, there's only like a couple more slides left anyway, actually two more slides and then, or then we can continue chatting. So GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. 
which I assume everyone's got like a bazillion emails in their email box because everyone updated their privacy policy to match this. To be clear, if you're wondering what the heck is it, it is a law affecting entities within, with EU-based customers or businesses. So if you have a customer that's in the EU, doesn't need to be a resident of EU, just need to be in the EU, they're affected. If you're doing business in Europe, you are affected. The big thing is that the power to fine organizations depends on the nature of the failure and it can go up to 10 million euro or 4% of global annual turnover. That's a lot of money, which is the reason why everyone was dumping out like the privacy policy updates and making sure that their uh, internal policies were in order. And if you've heard, certain sites decided to just not allow them to even see. Uh, I'm trying to remember, was it the New York Post or the Guardian? I can't remember which, but one, uh, was it Daily News? I can't remember. Literally, they blocked all of the EU because they did not want to deal with uh, having to deal with the fact that maybe someone from the EU is looking at an American newspaper. Or a British newspaper. I think it was an American newspaper. It must, it must have been. Uh, I think it was Daily. I thought it was the Daily News or the New York Post, but there was definitely one of those. It's a little bit. That's a little bit of a hard way of, of trying to resolve it because honestly, they had more than a year, like two years, to figure out how to do this. But of course, everyone's the nature of uh, security and privacy. Of course, is last minute. Get it on. You know, rush it, rush it, rush it. So. Anyway, uh, the additional things. So, so as part of it, additional data protections on security data processing and process requirements is basically mandated by GDPR. Uh, there, one of the things that everyone likes to know is that their personal data breaches, you know, personal data breach notification 72 hours to appropriate regulator is now a requirement. What is an appropriate regulator? And what does it mean to, when does the clock start on that 72 hours? These are things I think everyone is still working through. I, you know, this is at a higher level, but if you're a developer, you should at least be aware of the fact that this is the environment you're working. Like, why do I have to put in this new click through at thing that I need to add to my to the start of my privacy policy now to be when I launch the app and it has a privacy policy and I have to click OK now because GDPR. So I have a few more links regarding uh, places where I got some information. There is an official Android security topics page. Uh, yeah, I'll get back to that. And there is an Android compatibility definition document. Um, this is actually good for though for things with regards to like, can I like, does this feature really exist across all the different devices? And I, I only to one of the GDPR sources that I found on the recent. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Um, if there's anything specific about a particular slide, call out. Otherwise, let's we can go to the questions. And the one that I do see here is if an app uses Google sign in and not really using the server but stores info in the app, would I still need GDPR? Here's the thing. Um, you're you would be basically following the GDPR rules of Google. So it would be you, you as a sort of the, the recipient party would still need to put up a, a, pol a policy statement saying like, I'm follow like we're, we're all we're doing is a sign in and we're doing, and we're using uh, Google as the GDPR backend and man and letting them manage it all. If you are actually storing personal identifiable information on your, on this login, then yes, you're technically under the GDPR rules. Here's the thing, uh, and this is the, like, and, and this is one of the many discussions you'll hear in uh, a lot of different places is that this means that GDPR all of a sudden has become more onerous to the small business develop, small business owners and that thing, because it's like, I don't know, like, you know, I have only, you know, 10,000 customers and half of them are like three quarters in the US and maybe a quarter is in Europe. But, but you know, does, is it, do I need to worry, like, what at what point will 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 the regulators in the EU come after me? And the answer is, at this point, no one's really t completely clear or believing that they would actually go after the small businesses. They're going after like you know Facebook and Google to sort of like you know, to make a statement. Um, but in the end, if you're holding personal identifiable information, you would need to have a uh, data compliance officer, a data privacy. I forgot it was a data privacy or data compliance. There's also, uh, there's also like basically documentation about how how 
you are following the GDPR rules, which yes, that does sound onerous if you're just a two man developer shop, quite honestly. So Morrison, could you um, undo the um, screen sharing? Oh, and oh, okay. Yeah, hang on. Let me, uh, your face. And I guess I'd like to see that we do some addressing of Roy Garcia's question here. Uh, does security start at the level of source code? And if so, what kinds of tips can you give us? The, it, honestly, it, it, here's the deal. Do you, it really actually would depend upon the app. I mean, if, if the app that I am building is, well, here's the thing. Security is always sort of an inverse proportional to the amount of debug, it creates, creates, increasing security creates more debugging and more, more development effort. Since everyone's trying to get things out the door, increase, like this is always the big problem. Having a secure thing is great, but also means that if, it, that if the product is late or never comes out, then it's meaningless you have to sort of balance it with regard to what you're trying to do as a beginner. I really wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would only kind of keep it in the back of my mind as to what the app is. If it's a, you know, like a weather app or just a standard like to do app or something like that, I really wouldn't necessarily uh, worry about that too much. If you're starting to store things on the server side, like if you're outside of the instant that you've actually left the, left the device, you know, figure out like what is your authentication and authorization methods. And I was like, what, like who is allowed to see what and how do you, how do you uh, separate all that clearly? I'm not too sure if that's a great answer. Uh, it's a start. Well, like I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, in, a, in a previous life, I was writing some Ruby code and mm -hmm. I couldn't consider myself to be a Ruby expert. I could almost not consider myself to be um a Ruby intermediate person at the time, but I showed somebody my code. And when I did, he looked at one of the lines and said, okay, you can do this line differently. And the reason you should do this line differently is because the way you've done it is you've written this particular line of code so that it's um, vulnerable to SQL injection. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I said, I, you know, I don't know these tricks. Where am I going to, where are we going to find these tricks? So I guess that's the question is what are we possibly doing in our, Android code that unknowingly is making it vulnerable to some sort of attack. Are there so, are there so, places so, are there good places yeah. to find information about that? That's actually a good question. SQL injection is like so old; it's almost like one of those things we expect to teach people when they build their first web app. At this point, and it's also and it's also by the way, I found the statistic earlier um, this week. Still, one of those popular attacks. Yeah, that's true. I should I should probably just drop it in there just just to make sure that, uh, yeah, the the most the the most common one is the SQL injection injection attack where you have a string doing select something something where and you're actually putting the string value and you are not like uh like filtering the string or not like editing this like checking the string for to see if it's in the proper range or even using the value directly instead using like a, like an enum or something to actually like move the string there or uh, uh, you can actually use, I believe you can actually use in SQLite um, parameterization, but I'm, I need to go back and check. It's been a while. Okay. Um, are there good places? But, are there, are there, is there a place, is there a place to, to go to learn about this sort of thing? What am I doing in my code? That's actually a very good question. Um, and I really should, I do apologize. I really should go find something nice. As I told oh. you earlier, you should make up an answer. Lie to us if you don't have one. I look honestly. I I, I literally would probably okay. The my fake answer is, is yeah. Stack Overflow and actually okay. try to understand like <laughs> like like how like realize that that data sanitization is always an expectation of security, uh, but. And then I, I will have to probably add in data sanitization is always an expectation of security. And if you don't do it, you will get a messy house. Okay. Let me, let me, um, do, do you see the, um, yeah, I got the chat chat now. here and the other questions that are coming yeah. up. Uh, okay. So Lloyd Smith is asking, um, possible to scatter and store keys among multiple devices. Here's the thing. A uh, device is typically is used either by one person or a pair of persons, but the idea is that it is just, um, one person's use per time. In other words, I, I am like, you know, uh, foo, a, B, foo, one, two, three. 
if you're talking about like like API keys on the other hand are typically already like distributed amongst your you know however many like as, like devices you're able to distribute to then it becomes a server side issue to see if um, people are doing nefarious things with your keys um, but honestly it you here's the thing if you're storing the keys among multiple devices how do you reconstitute them back from the multiple devices that's really where it boils down to like how do we if you need it to be in multiple places how do you put it back so it's in one thing again that you need it as the one thing and Lloyd, where would those multiple devices be? I'm having yeah. trouble understanding that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so that's sort of the way how I'm thinking of it. I'm assuming you're thinking like, and I have a, I have two different phones. Is there a way I can break it up? That kind of thing. And the answer is that doesn't quite make much sense because those two phones have pretty much act fully as a phone, and the apps have to act as full apps, not as parts of apps. Um, you could have. Um, well, it's kind of like I'm thinking. I'm thinking something like um, two-factor authentication, um, which is sort of getting along that idea where you log on and then before yeah, you, but after if, typing in your password, you get a text, and so it's a separate device. You have to get the text from your phone. Yeah, there's also there's Google Authenticator, there's Authenticator, Microsoft has an Authenticator, uh, which you pretty much have to scan a QR code or put in a string. Um, uh, all that kind of thing. Leave a blood um, sample or something on your. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I think I'm losing this. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's you know it it's I you, each one is supposed to act independently of the other at this point, or at least that's the that's the business model or that's the design model. So that literally it goes back to how are you designing it and how does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so you see Roy Garcia's question there? Yeah. Made sure that I can debug my app to make it work and maybe tweak for security later. There's, there is coming up the issue of security first versus security as a. As, yeah. So, as so right. Again, go back to the threat model. What are you protecting against as you're writing the app? Right, if this app is going to be a game, you're better be thinking about it from almost the start. If it's not, if it's a game that you're pretty much giving away for free and don't care if they crack it, then because it's there, you know, uh, that's fine. You don't need to worry about it. Realize though that just because you don't necessarily treat it, if you have server side resources, you that that may be impacted. For example, I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of free apps that a lot that you know that have pirated versions where maybe a large percentage of the connections they're getting onto their server side are actually from the pirated versions. Well, how do you manage that? Well, that actually means that either you try to do some sort of either detection or you have to start filtering them in some way or you have internal like magic kill switches that they haven't found yet and they will and you can act, do, do that as well. Um, again, that's sort of along the lines of how do you know your app is going to be popular before it's popular? And the answer is you don't. Um, but that also means that since you're on Android, since you're going to be iterating quickly, you can, if you are, they're going to be um, getting popular fast. Like, oh, I expected maybe a you know few thousand downloads or ten thousand you know clients. All of a sudden, you got like a couple million, and all of a sudden now your servers are like like all of a sudden you realize that the servers are like getting a massively hit. That's when you maybe start adding in mitigation, like things to do. But at this point. It, Beyond the most basic, you know, uh, data sanitization, SQL injection stuff. Um, trying to think of anything else. Nah. Let me interrupt with another point here. Gwen says there are open source tools for static code analysis, like SonarCube and BlackDuck, mm -hmm. that look for source code, code security vulnerability, including SQL injection. Um, those might be very useful, especially for people just starting out. Yeah. Um, I, the thing to realize is that by that point you are in a larger team and everyone doesn't necessarily trust everybody. Like whether or not, whether or not you have code reviews to do everything. And honestly, it, if you can afford the tools and they're, and they solve the problem, do use them. Okay. Uh, now, now you mentioned, you mentioned games and you say with games, you should start doing security from day one. I'm, coming at it in my head from a different angle, namely that games are less serious than what I would call useful, productive type applications. Um, a, a game might store my leaderboard information, but who cares? 
Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so this is the, the added. Okay. So the question becomes then what, at what point does the impact on your server resources or your ability to make money get shifted? What I mean games, games is typically the loot boxes and the, and the, uh, the microtransactions and the things of that nature, in which case then they, they are truly dependent upon making sure that they don't necessarily trust the client to be too completely like it is, it is delivering the content and that's the value. If you are, uh, but it also, but it also means that you, it also is a, the case of like, who is more willing to attack it than, I don't know, your, your, your exercise app or something like that, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the it's really the case of uh, like who is the attacker and why would they go after it? Now, perfectly honestly, you can have a great like you know like seven day exercise type app, in which case then maybe you're recording stuff in the cloud and which or you're doing some other stuff. But then the issue then becomes like okay, what are you like? Do you have microtransactions? If you do, how do you manage those? Um, Games typically have are are much more on the bleeding edge with regard to problems uh, and with regard to the various business models, microtransactions, ad revenue. Uh, they themselves have have like long play content. Um, so typically, I would look to I I use that as the example of people who have already gone through the problem set, and that would be sort of like look, look taking at their learnings and seeing how to handle my app. I'm reading um, questions from the uh, group chat. Uh, um, yeah. Or you can read them too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can find it. Uh, Rockaway SQL, GPB issue server has all the PI deleted every few hours. Here's the issue. Uh, what's your policy on Let's GPR? So, so the question from Mark Q, Mark, uh, Mark G is, would GDPR be still be a big issue if the server that has all the PI deleted every few hours? Well, one, why you even have it on the server if you're going to delete it every few hours? The idea is that you would save state for the next time the person logs in. Um, two, you still have to kind of have a policy in the, about, about like what, like what, why was it there? Um, or even like if the if the business case is I can delete every few hours, then you have to really explain the business case why you would even need it for the two few hours. Um, if you're thinking of trying to do anonym, anonymizing the data maybe for, for downstream use, they actually kind of reference that sort of stuff going on in the GDPR documentation and some of the white papers I've, I've kind of glanced at. So uh, unless I get a better sense of what the model is, I'm going to go like, yeah, it might still have to, you're going to have to still deal with it. Um, what's the best way to save my publisher app from treating hacking, maybe like reverse engineering, how to handle network calls, which contain important info to save from hacking. Yeah, Again, uh, uh, Morrison, slow down. If you read a question, read it slowly. Oh, okay. Sorry. What is, oh, sorry. I forgot that you're videotaping this. So Rakesh, probably apologies to the name. Uh, what is the best way to save my published apps from intruders hacking, maybe like reverse engineering, how to handle network calls, which might contain important info to save from hacking. The answer is if the person who really wants to do it, will do it. There is nothing you can do. You can make it harder for them you can make it really difficult for them, but in the end, there isn't much you can do, which, is, well, there is much you can do in the sense that you're slowing them down, but you're not stopping them. If you're, if you are like, uh, uh, like literally like Bitcoin or something like that, like inside of the app, and you're not going, like you're, you, too much value is now, is now located within that device that they won't try to get in. Um, that, but that sorry to say that is try to make your app secure. Yeah. Uh, next question: Similar encryption tools available to prevent reverse engineering or APK files or other solutions. You can obfuscation is pretty much the limit. Um, you can obfuscate through uh, calling some things in JNI, which is C calls. Um, so the 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 Dex Java type type stuff doesn't look less, like it starts looking to be different, but in the end you still have to cross the barrier back with the magic numbers or keys or maybe sets of keys and then maybe you can you mix and munge them appropriately. But still, um, they they could always still if a computer can walk through your code, another human being can walk through your code and figure out how it works. 
It's just a matter of how much effort that person has to do it. Normally for people to work through your code, you're paying them because you're the developer. Can you just take one minute to explain obfuscation and what it is? So obfuscation is not having the symbol table. Okay, so when you're debugging, you know such and such is on line 22, you know that variable, the string, string uh, title has, has, has the app name, things like that. If you just call the string A, the computer will still send the string A, it will still, will still send that string to the correct place. It just, all, all the, the symbol now is says A and AA and BB and basically nonsense names. So the idea is that it, the, both the class names as well as variable names no longer has any meaning. So you pretty much, you're trying to rip out all of the symbolic information out of it. You may still need to have parts of it with the true name, mainly for reflection type applications, uh, things that require reflection or third parties need to access it and needs to know its name during runtime. So basically the idea is, and, you know, is changing the code so that it's more difficult for a human to read. Right. And, and therefore so, more difficult to reverse engineer. Yeah. Um, wish I could reduce the video settings. Hang on. I might have to just, can I, oh, I can't do that right now. Anyway, uh, micro transitions are very important. Another thing, but a harmless attack mechanism is like complaining. Right. Uh, some discussion. Uh, okay. So, so even apps with a subscription should we watch out too? Yeah. There is license server. There is other the billing in-app billing server and things like that. Subscription, uh, conceivably, you, what ends up happening is is that you know that subscriber ID one two three four five is coming from certain sets of IP addresses because he or she is using their in their country of origin. If all of a sudden it starts showing up in different countries at the same time or different places, that's definitely an indication that it has been leaked or cracked and you may need to find ways of either mitigating that either by basically cutting them off or maybe an app sort of like degrade the degrade the behavior indicating that we know that this somehow is leaked uh, it sucks for the owner but that assumes that owner uh the original purchaser uh is either going to be like uh, is either going to be someone who notices and therefore is going to complain but that's going to be unfortunate but his or her key or his or her identity has now leaked out and you know you get from from one person's sub uh, ten dollars monthly subscription is now you know a thousand ten thousand people playing across the globe yeah it's basically it's basically you have to think about it from a uh, from both the the client and the server side and the server side because as long as that doesn't get hacked <laughs> uh, you still have the capability of uh, mitigating your damages. And I, and I use the word, you're reducing your damages, you're not going to get rid of it, you're still going to get people trying to, you know, play the game if they have like someone's like uh, identity, and, but the identity is leaked and now there's like 10,000 people. Well, you know, can see it in your logs. Hey, 10,000 people are logged in at the same time with the same ID. Well, that's wrong. That, that doesn't work. You know. um, ProGuard obfuscation. Yes, ProGuard is also good for reducing the file size of your APK. Always a good thing. Uh, uh, protecting card info. I thought that only goes through Google Play. I'm going to have to review the play, the subscription services again a bit. Um, they get more and more complicated every time I look at them. Yeah, I'm going to have to get through, go through the subscription services. Um, realize that if you're doing the subscription services, you're still going to have your own server. So and that's where you would meet, maybe have the fallback situation of where things go wrong. Um, yeah, saying all info would be in the SQL data and subscription through Google Play. I'm going to have to look, but I could have swore that you would still need to have a server component in there. And if you have a server component, that's where I would start holding some of the, the, the you know, the what you can do to hack. You know, what basically you need to have a mechanism by which, if you are hacked, how do you manage it? And the server side, which would hold some of the content is pretty much the only way that you have to sort of do anything. Like you could basically set a flag saying like, you know, kill these, uh, basically turn off these apps and say like, haha, well, or say like, uh, due to, uh, due to uh, identity leak, we, we, we understand you're not, you know, this account has now been 
locked or whatever, you know, and, you know, or, or it has been found in multiple IPs or whatever like that. So, you know, in, or in violation of terms of service and they just kill it. They'll go back, they'll try to rehack it, but this is no different than as I, as I describe it as the gamers, the game, the, 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 the game developers, whoever had been doing this for years now. And, um, and even, even before you do something about having been hacked, you have to have a plan for detecting that you've been hacked. Right. So that's what I meant by IP addresses, identities. So if you have, if you are literally selling an app or, or, you know, even in, um, uh, even if you're, even if you're a free app, you're going to put analytics in that app, right? That uh, those analytics tell you what country it's in, how many times they turn on, what's the average uh, uh, time that the user has interacted with it. These metrics still have to feed up either to uh, 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 analytics server or to your server. Um, either way, that connection means that you at least have some. You can start putting in, like, what happens if you lose control. Like, for example. Uh, I distinctly remember one case uh, reading about like someone actually a relatively not so popular game, but someone actually changed the ad, the ad ID <laughs> to someone else's <laughs> trying to get their uh, ad revenue. It's weird that that would be impossible, but it, I can kind of see some ways of that happening. And, and as long as it doesn't hit thresholds by either the ad, ad vendor or you, then it's conceivable that you don't notice it until it's too late. So Mac asks, is there a way to set up alerts or triggers if you to let you know that you get hacked uh, the problem is you actually have to write those in and it's also possible that if they're reverse engineering your app they will take it out so oh. that's yeah so 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 always assume the client is compromised if, if you're being very serious you have to always assume the client is compromised and you're going to have to then protect the server because you can actually control the server a little bit better. It's one place, one place ish. And you know, you can say, Oh, I'm getting hit by everybody from Europe or uh, I'm getting hit by everybody in, in like Florida for some reason, even though that makes no sense, you know, that kind of thing for a cold weather app uh, or some other specific metric that indicates a change in your, in your audience behavior. So it's also you have to kind of know what your audience is doing as well. Uh, this is this gets into more of what your business model is, and it gets kind of complicated. The reason I use games is games everyone kind of understands, and therefore they can kind of understand like uh, what uh, what needs to be done. Unless you're truly doing a AAA title, you're not going to do all this stuff. But if you are doing something like a, a, a raffle app or something along those lines, all of a sudden you're talking about money, and then you are the same kind of a target as a AAA game. People are gonna to try to hack the raffle, people are trying to make sure that they're the next winner. All of that stuff is gonna happen, in which case then that has to be on the server side so that you can actually control it and, and figure out where it's coming from, maybe have various obfuscated metrics coming in from your app so you can kind of tell like, oh wait, the signature is now different, so it must have been hacked, you know, that kind of thing you actually it requires then planning planning from the get-go so um can we do 25 words or less summary takeaway what should we all remember from the discussion that you've done tonight what's the what's what's the most critical gem here sorry to hit you with that question at the last <laughs> minute i i think i already said it your client is insecure um uh, business means, but it, you know, but and and how to handle the fact that your your client is insecure is really depends upon what business the app is trying to accomplish. I I don't know if there was a distress on the line when you said that. One more time, Morrison. Okay. Let, I'm, yeah, I'm realizing I'm, that this will be the third time for you, but one more time. I, I'm gonna go this slowly. In the end, you can't trust the client. How to handle that depends upon what your business, what the business of the app is trying to accomplish, and what threats are you willing to deal with for the cost of dealing with those threats. Okay, very good. That's it. That's if, good. If, that's that's good advice. Yeah. 
So thank you everyone for attending tonight. I'm gonna to post this on YouTube. I'll uh, post the link to this presentation on the Udacity Grow with Google um, Slack groups. I wanna thank Morrison again for yep. doing the presentation. I wanna thank everybody for attending. If you have any important feedback, then um, send it to me as a direct message in the Grow with Google um, Udacity Slack groups and keep on coding.